So we've been talking about uh, P and NP and uh, the time complexity classes. And today we're gonna shift gear. We're gonna talk about uh, space complexity uh, or memory complexity as uh, space complexity is what complexity theorists uh, usually referred, refer to it as. Um, and, um, you know, time and space are the two basic, most basic measures of complexity that, uh, that we consider. And so um, today we're going to look at uh, the, the second of those two, um, the space complexity. Uh, so we will uh, define, it, a lot of this is going to be by analogy with what um, we did for time complexity. We're going to define complexity classes. We'll talk about uh, polynomial space and non-deterministic polynomial space, um, see how those uh, classes connect up with the time complexity classes that we've already defined, and we'll do some examples um, that will be setting us up for our uh, further discussion about space complexity next week. So we're going to talk about, first of all, what it means for a Turing machine to run in a certain amount of space. Uh, and that's simply going to be counting the number of cells that the Turing machine scans over on its tape during the course of its computation. You might be reading that cell, might be writing on that cell, but the total number of cells that it actually um, visits, um, of course, visiting the same cell multiple times only counts once because space can be reused. Uh, but we're gonna count the number of cells that the Turing machine visits during the course of its computation and then define the space utilization by analogy with what we did for time. So we'll say a Turing machine runs in a certain amount of space, F of N, we'll say, if first of all, it has to always hold. So all of the machines are deciders and it uses at most that much uh, tape that much uh, that, that the, the, it, it visits that number of cells on all inputs of length n. So just like we said for time complexity, the machine has to run within t of n time on all inputs uh, of length n. Here it's going to have to use at most f of n cells on all inputs of length n in order for it to be running in space f of n. Okay. A tape cell is simply a little square of, of the tape where you can write a symbol. Okay, answering a question, that good question that came in from the chat. So, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure we have, I have a di diagram for that, but the, um, you know, each of the little squares on the tape are gonna be the tape cells. Generally, we're gonna be sticking to one tape Turing machines, but I'll make a brief remark about multi-tape Turing machines shortly. Better? Tape cells, sorry, uh, on all inputs of length n. Uh, so a Turing, now, okay, so that, that's for deterministic uh, Turing machines. For non-deterministic Turing machines, we will say uh, that it um, also runs in a certain amount of space. So for a non-deterministic machine, it has to use at most that many tape cells on each branch of its computation separately. You don't add up the total number of cells used across all of the branches, just like we don't add up the total amount of time the machine uh, uses across all of its branches. For the machine to be running in say space n squared, it has to be using at most n squared cells or order n squared cells on each one of its non-deterministic branches separately. Um, there might be exponentially many branches, so that's okay. Um, but on each branch, it's gonna be using at most n squared or order n squared cells. Uh, importantly though, that the, still the machine has to be a decider. It's not enough to be looping forever and using a small amount of space. Um, it could do that, but that's not gonna count toward the machine contributing to its um, uh, space complexity of that language. So for uh, the machine to be running in a certain amount of space, we say that the machine 
uh, holts on all of its branches, and each one of its branches uses at most uh, that much space. Okay. Um, again, I, I can see lots of typos here. Thank you. Um, how did I mess this all up today? Uh, so I'm non deterministic. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna define the uh, space complexity classes analogous to this time complexity classes. So these are languages that you can do with machines that run within that space bound. So um, space F of N, you can think of it, space N squared um, is all of the language that a deterministic one tape Turing machine um, can do within, uh, can decide within, by using at most n squared tape cells or order n squared tape cells. Similarly, the non-deterministic space uh, complexity class are all of the uh, languages that a non-deterministic one tape Turing machine can decide running within that amount of space. Okay. Um, and lastly, we have uh, polynomial space. So that's the union over all polynomial space bounds of the space complexity class and non-deterministic polynomial space. It's the same for all of the non-deterministic uh, polynomial space classes, okay? So I think I do have a check-in on this, um, whoops, um, which talks about uh, multi-tape Turing machines. So we could define space complexity for multi-tape Turing machines, just as we've been doing, which just as we did for one-tape Turing machines, and then define the associated space complexity classes, and then define the class P space. But that would be for multi-tape Turing machines. Um, now for time, uh, remember that the class P that you would get for multi-tape Turing machines is exactly the same as the class P that we got for one-tape Turing machines. Um, that was part of the nice quality of the class P. It's robust in that sense and natural. So how about for P space? Um, what do you think? Do we get the same class? Um, no, maybe. Or yes, because we can convert a multi-tape Turing machine to a single-tape Turing machine by only squaring the amount of space. Um, that was what happened with time, as you remember. Or maybe we can do even better. Converting a multi-tape Turing machine to a single tape only increases it by, by less, by say a constant factor. Here, remember, we have, this is how we're defining space complexity for multi-tape Turing machines. We're taking the sum of all the cells used on all of the tapes. All right, so uh, let's launch that poll and see what you think. Hopefully this is not too hard. Um, yeah, I think most of you have got the idea though. Some of you are, I, I worry sometimes about some of the <laughs> answers that I get. I don't know if you're serious or you're really com badly confused. Um, uh, but anyway, let's, um, let's wrap this up. Another um, 10 seconds or so. Last call. Okay, I'm gonna end it. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think answer B is a reasonable answer. In fact, uh, answer C is the correct answer. Uh, you can, if you just look at the same simulation from multi-tape to single tape uh, and how much space overhead that simulation introduces. Um, it's only linear. You're basically just taking all of the tapes of the multi-tape machine and writing them down next to one another. Obviously, you know, ignoring all the infinite, infinitely many blanks, we're just taking the active portion of the tapes, writing them down next to each other. So the total amount used is just gonna be the sum uh, on the single tape of what was used on each of the um, individual multi-tapes in the original machine. Uh, so there's just a linear cost overhead 
um, by converting from multi-tape to single tape when you're looking at space, the amount of memory that's used. Um, for time, remember, there was some additional overhead because we had to be uh, updating um, where the virtual heads were, and that uh, cost uh, extra time to move our single head around to do that. But for space, the amount of time that's introduced is not is irrelevant. We're only looking at the amount of memory, and so that's a, um, a linear going to be just a you know the overhead on that is very low. Uh, I would do worry about the folks who are answering A, for example, in this uh, for this question. You should be be, be rethinking what's what what's really going on here. Um, uh, so, okay. Um, now. Let us um, move on here from, from that to, to our next uh, slide and compare uh, the time and space complexity classes, you know, or time and space complexity. How, how do they relate to one another? And so, uh, first of all, we're going to point out um, let's uh, start out here. T of n is going to be represent some bound either on the time or the amount of space, and generally, at least up till this point, um, and most of the, mostly going forward, though there's going to be one um, uh, variation on that a little later. But we're going to be focusing on uh, bounds which are at least big enough to either read the input or at least hold the input. So that's why we sp we refer to T of n being at least n. Um, so now if we look at uh, the time complexity class T of n, think of that T of n like typically would be say n squared maybe. And the things that you can do in n squared time, I claim you can also do in n squared space. Um, and basically um, it's just using the very same machine. Suppose you have a machine that runs in n squared time. How could it possibly use, say, n square, n cubed space if it's running only in n squared time? Even if it tries to use as much tape as it possibly could, as many tape cells as it possibly could, and you know, sending its head cruising out um, into the blank portion of the tape, chewing up as much uh, as many tape cells as it possibly can, in in n squared time, it's only going to be able to use n squared space. So the very same machine that runs in T of n time is also going to run in T of n space. Um, so this containment here follows, you know, re really without doing um, any work at all. Um, so just re restating that here, um, a uh, Turing machine that runs in T of n steps cannot use more than T of n tape cells. Okay, so right now we're focusing on, we could prove some analogous statements about non-deterministic complexity, um, but let's focus here on the deterministic complexity. Uh, now let's look at going the other direction. Suppose we have a Turing machine that uses T of n space now. Does that immediately imply it's using only T of n time? And that's uh, not so clear, and in fact, probably not true, uh, because a space appears to be much more powerful than, than time. And within a certain amount of space, you can run for much longer than that same amount of time. Um, so how long could you run? So what, what you can show is that if you're running uh, within a certain amount of space, T of n space, let's say you know, n squared space, uh, for example, the amount of time you could use is going to be exponential in n squared. Say two to the order n squared. Um, sometimes we also write that as the union of c to the um, n squared by sort of pulling down that constant here. If you want, well, it's also just to understand what we mean by order t of n up in the exponent. It means that the union over c to the t of n for all c. Either of these are just completely equivalent. So whichever one you're more comfortable with. But why is this going to be true? Why does a Turing machine that runs in say um, uh, say n squared space use at most uh, uh, 
two to the order n squared time. And that's because if you look at how many possible configurations the machine can have, uh, remember that a configuration is, is essentially um, the contents of the tape. There's also the head position and the state, but the dominant, um, uh, the, the dominant aspect of a configuration is the tape. And so how many different tape contents can you have? Well, it's going to be exponential in the, so in the length of that tape uh, because you know, each cell can have some fixed number of symbols in it. If a machine repeats a configuration, it's going to go forever, which we're forbidding um, in, uh, in, a, in, the, in these machines because they're all going to be deciders. So they can only run um, uh, for an amount of time which is bounded by the number of configurations that the machine can have. And so if the machine can have, uh, uh, you know, if it's running in T of n space, um, then the amount of time that it, it could be running is going to be at most some constant to the T of n, or two to the order of T of n, saying the same thing. Uh, you know, unless it's going to repeat a configuration and end up looping. Okay, so these are the two fundamental connections between time and space. Time is contained within the same amount of space. Space is contained within that amount of time exponentiated. Okay, um, so one corollary of that is that the class P is contained within P space. Similarly, NP is going to cont be contained within NP space for the very same reason. Um, okay, is this um, understandable? You know, this uh, this is a good place, or in a moment, I have one more line to 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 to, to tell you about. But leading into the next slide, where so th if you understand the definitions of what we've done so far, all of the the, the, the this is a this is a fairly straightforward theorem, and the and the corollary is immediate. Okay, so um, anything that you can do in n squared time, you can do in n squared space. And so for if anything you can do in polynomial time, you can also do in polynomial space. Yes, yeah, C, somebody's asking me, you know, what is the C? C is essentially going to be the size of the tape alphabet. Because um, that's going to govern how many different configurations you have. There's a slight extra uh, factor, a slight, you know, slight extra factor for the tape, um, the, the head, location and also the um, state. But uh, the, the main thing is going to be the uh, number of tape symbols and the length of the tape. OK, but what's going to come next is we're going to prove something more powerful than uh, this corollary that P is contained in P space. Because not only is P contained in P space, but NP is also contained in P space. And for that, we're going to have to do more work. Um, so somebody's asking me about the number of states. The number of states is going to be in de is fixed depend upon depending on the machine only. So um, they it doesn't depend upon the, uh, the depend upon n. So it could at most affect um, the number of configurations by a constant factor, and those constant factors are going to be absorbed within the definitions of these uh, complexity classes. Because that's how you know, we've defined them to be, um, uh, you know, ignoring the constant factors. But, you know, wh why don't we just take a, you know, this may be a good place to pause for a second and uh, see if there's any questions. Because, you know, I think for some of you, this may be um, straightforward, but you know, I, I think it's less common to be measuring, thinking about uh, the amount of memory as a complexity measure. Um, so this is perhaps a little less familiar. Some of you have seen measuring time in other classes, but the mem measuring the, the amount of space that the algorithm uses probably is a little less familiar. And maybe that's, it's worth spending a moment or two answering questions about that.
So I, I'm not sure I understand the question that just came in, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it out there. Is it possible that a Turing machine can loop forever? Absolutely. But a Turing machine that loops forever does not count as one that runs within the space bound. To run within the space bound, the machine must halt on every input. It has to be a decider. We're only considering deciders here. So is it possible that a Turing machine can loop forever? Yes. Isn't the Turing machine we're talking about a member of space and thus a decider? Hmm. Um, not totally sure I understand the question, but um, if a Turing machine is um, not halting on all inputs, it's not a decider. That's our def definition. Um, are we good? And we're not getting very many questions here. So I'm assuming you're all with me or so lost, you don't even know what to ask, which is not good. Um, so be, be bold. If you're confused, throw a question out there because I, I don't want to race through this lecture since it's, it's a, maybe a little less familiar to some of you. Okay, so let's move on. Um, as promised, I'm going to show you now that NP, not only P as is kind of happens immediately, but NP is contained as a subset of a of P space. So that is, oh, I did get a question. I moved on before I answered this question. Can I explain part two of the proof again? Part two. Okay, let's just do it. Um, uh, if something runs in a certain amount of space, you have to just think about how many different configurations the machine can have within that amount of space. Remember the configurations that we defined way back at LBAs? Um, so the number of configurations the machine can have depends on how much space it, it's allocated. Like the LBAs, they had a fixed number of configurations and we gave a calculation for that, um, which is basically an exponential in the amount of space. That's how many configurations the machine can have. So um, if the machine is not, a, is not looping, if it's a decider, it can never repeat a configuration. And that's gonna tell us how long the machine can possibly run for. You know, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's important to understand. I'm, I'm not sure if I knew how to say that in any way that different from what I said before, but um, okay, getting back now to proving that NP is a, a subset of P space. So now, now we're gonna have to do something that's sort of in a way uh, different from what we did on the previous slide, because now it's not gonna be enough to work with the same machine. Before when we were converting, we're showing that a certain amount of time, time class is contained within a space class. It was by, by virtue of the very same machine, by just showing that if it's running within a certain amount of time, then it has to be running within that same amount of space, within that same amount of space. Um, or in terms of the space, it was in the X, given a certain amount of space, it has to be running that same machine within a certain amount of time. Uh, here, we're gonna mixing non-determinism and determinism. So we're gonna have to take an, a machine that's an, uh, an NP type machine, a non-deterministic polynomial type machine, and convert it into a deterministic machine that doesn't use a whole lot of space. So there's a difference in the character of this theorem because we have to introduce a new machine. Um, and so the way we're gonna prove that, um, you know, I, I'm gonna take advantage of some of the things we've already shown um, to prove this. One could also prove it a little bit more directly, and maybe it's worth understand, making sure you understand both proofs. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to observe is that SAT, our NP-complete language, um, the satisfiability language, itself is a member of P-space. And the reason for that is um, when you're given a formula, and now you want to test if that formula is satisfiable. One way to do it, the most obvious way to do it, is try all assignments one by one and see if any of them satisfy the formula. Now that's gonna take a lot of time, but how much space does it use? I have in mind reusing the space every time we try the next assignment. Think of going through all of the assignments the way an odometer would work, just trying every possible assignment 
but reusing the space where you're going to write that assignment down, um, sort of incrementing it like, like a number um, written in binary, if you wish, um, uh, going through all the possible assignments. Every time you get in the next assignment, you plug it into the formula and see if the formula is satisfied. If it is, then you can accept immediately. If not, you go on to the next assignment. And only when you've gone through all the assignments in that way, um, and none of them have satisfied the formula, then you can reject. So how much space does that use? That doesn't use a whole lot of space because you're reusing the space um, to write down one assignment after the next. Okay, that's only gonna be using an amount of space which is big enough to hold an assignment, which is basically linear because it's the size of the number of variables of the formula. So that's gonna be a linear amount of space to solve the satisfiability problem. And so the satisfiability problem is certainly in P space. Um, step one. Step two is we're gonna take advantage of what we know about reducibility. Um, so if A is polynomial time reducible to B, we've already commented, we didn't say this exactly in this way, but you know, it's still gonna follow that anything you can do in a certain amount of time, you can also do in that amount of space because there's a very same machine um, doesn't, can't use any more space than the amount of time it was allocated. So if A is polynomial time reducible to B, it's also gonna be reducible in polynomial space. The, the, a polynomial space machine could do the reduction. So that means if A um, is polynomial time reducible to B and B is in polynomial space, then A is also in polynomial space. But we know because satisfiability is NP complete, that every language of NP is reducible to SAT. So put SAT in place of B. Every NP language is polynomial time reducible to SAT. And we now know that SAT is in P space. So therefore every language in NP is in P space because they're all polynomial time reducible to SAT. Okay, so just by using some of the technology we've developed um, namely, the notion of completeness sort of shows that some of its power that if you want to conclude something about an entire class, an entire complexity class, if you have a complete problem for that complexity class, often it's enough just to work with the complete problem. And then everything else, by virtue of the reducibility, is going to uh, inherit the same property. It doesn't work in all cases, but in many of the cases, as long as the um, you know, the reducibility can be computed by the, um, uh, by the, procedure, the type of procedure you're working with, um, then, you can, then it follows. Uh, you know, you could also prove this more directly. I think it's in some ways a little clumsier, a little bit um, uh, less elegant, but you can say, well, let me just take my, um, uh, take a language that's in NP. It has a non-deterministic polynomial time algorithm and then give a deterministic polynomial space algorithm which simulates that uh, NP algorithm just by going through all the different branches, but making sure that going through all those different branches, you're reusing the space and not using new space every time you're going through a different branch. And you can arrange things if you're uh, just a little bit careful to do it that way. So you could give a direct simulation in polynomial space of any uh, NP Turing machine. So that, I mean, that's also completely satisfactory. Um, but I think this is a little more elegant. Um, so now let's also, this furthermore is going to allow us to conclude some additional languages are in P space. Let's define a, a class we have not yet seen, though maybe you've seen this. I think we've talked about this, this notion of uh, co before. Um, I think we talked about co-Turing reducible, uh, co-Turing recognizable. Um, so uh, the class, you know, those are the class of languages whose complements are Turing recognizable, and the same for co and p. This is the class of languages whose complements are in NP. So you take the complement of every language that's in NP, and now you get all the languages that are in this class, co NP, complement of NP. Um, so, for example, the complement of the hand path problem. So all the graphs which don't have Hamiltonian paths from you know, S to T, 
So the 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 non-Hamiltonian uh, graph, uh, the non-Hamiltonian path problem. Um, that's a Cohen P problem. Um, or here's a language we haven't. When, when I'm not going to define uh, as in terms of its complement. It's a, the tautology problem. So these are the um, problem language. The, the, these are all formulas. Oh, the, these are the formulas where all assignments satisfy the formula. All assignments make the formula true. Um, so a tautology is a statement that's always true. So no matter how you plug in the variables. So um, the, the tautology, tautology language is in co-NP um, because it's complement, which are the non-tautologies. Those are the formulas for which um, there's some assignment which makes it false. So that's going to be clearly an NP language. So tautology is uh, a co-NP language. Okay. Um, now, one thing that we get immediately from the theorem as a corollary, well, I should write this as a corollary, is that co-NP is also a subset of P-space. And the reason for that is, and this is something that, you know, it's a, um, again, easy, but make sure you understand it, is that P-space itself is closed under complement because it is uh, defined in terms of deterministic machines. And deterministic machines, you can always flip the answer and get a machine of the same type, which um, uh, uh, will decide the complementary language. So for deterministic machines, uh, de de deterministic deciders, I should say. Um, you can always flip the answer. Um, now, uh, so here we have anything that's in p-space, it has a deterministic polynomial time, a polynomial space uh, machine. And so its complementary language is also going to be in p-space. So p-space and co-space, co-p-space are equal. And so that's why co-NP uh, is going to be in p-space. It's going to be a subset of p-space. Okay, I hope that's not getting mixed up by all of the different uh, uh, alphabet soup here, but um, uh, here, here is maybe a picture, maybe that'll be helpful uh, of how the world looks for the time and space uh, complexity classes um, so far. Uh, so we have P is a subset of NP. It's also a subset of co-NP. Um, Again, for the same reason that P and co-P are equal. We never, never even really talk about co-P because it's the same as P. Um, uh, but NP and co-NP, th those are two classes where we don't know whether they're equal or not. Um, because an NP machine, um, you know, you can't necessarily complement the behavior of an NP, NP machine and end up with an NP machine. So uh, question, how do, do we know that Cohen P is a complete class of problems? I, I didn't say that there's anything about completeness and Cohen P is just a collection of languages. I'm not saying that it's anything, any particular feature about it. In fact, it does have a complete problem just like NP has a complete, uh, ha complete problem. The complements, and I'm not gonna prove this right here, but though it's pretty straightforward, the complements of all the NP complete languages are gonna be Cohen P complete languages. Um, and um, so, uh, so I'm getting so okay. So let's. I will answer some of the questions about or about possible alternate worlds. This is how we believe the world looks like, with, with each one of these regions being separated from one another, including this little corner of the world here, NP and intersect co-NP, which is not. Um, there might be languages in here which are not in P, and we actually believe there are such languages. But again, all of this is conjectural. Um, and even whether P and P space are the same or different is an, un, is an open question. We don't even know the answer to that, which is perhaps even more shocking that we don't know how to solve P and N, you know, prove P different from NP, that we don't know how to prove P different from P space, which seems to be a much bigger class. Uh, it would be incredible that anything you can do with a polynomial amount of space, uh, you can also do with a polynomial amount of time. 
um, but uh, don't know how to prove that they're different. And in fact, so this is how the world could look. Um, everything could collapse down. P could equal P space, and then all of these classes would be the same. Um, and I should also mention, I don't have this as, a, as another diagram here, but just to answer, you know, there's also another poss there's other possibilities. For example, um, P could equal NP without it being equal to P space. And then you'd have a different looking Venn diagram here where there'd be just two classes, P, NP, and co-NP would all be the same. P space would be different. That's possible. We, well, at least we have no idea. Uh, had a had a, 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 lot, a lot of these things can collapse in, in various ways, um, and you just have to make sure that you you know there are some collapses that obviously could not uh, occur. Like p if p equals n p, it's also going to equal co n p. Um, so you can't get some. There are obviously some crazy collapses which could not uh, happen. That p collapsing p and n p being the same but different from co n p that can't happen. But um, uh, avoiding some obvious contradictory situations, everything else is possible. So somebody says, so well, here's a question. Let me just answer a few of these. Did we use the completeness of co-NP to show that co-NP is a, a subset of co-P space? No, we didn't do it that way. We showed that uh, co-NP, um, uh, oh, let's see, did we, is that fair? Um, well, I, I suppose, you know, NP of subset of P space immediately implies, because he's complementing both sides, that co-NP is a subset of co-P space. So you don't have to deal with the, the complete problems on the other side. Right, that's too complicated to get into here, but you, didn't, you don't need to talk about co-NP complete problems. Um, though, again, those are very simple to, to get from NP complete problems. Um, let's see what else is here. Uh, are there NP complete problems that are in co-NP? So the answer to that is no, uh, not, not as far as, well, I mean, there would be, if there was an NP complete problem in co-NP, then all of NP would be in co-NP and they would be equal. So we suspect the NP complete problems are not in co NP, but don't know how to prove that. Um, so why is tautology in co NP? So here is tautology sits in this class here. The reason is that it's complementary language is in NP. The comp complement of tautology are the languages where there is some assignment which makes the formula false. So with, a, with an NP machine, you can just guess that assignment and check that it makes the formula false. So the complement of tautology is an NP language. And so tautology is a co-NP language. Um, OK. Uh, so somebody's asking about P space and NP space and how do those relate to one another. So that's looking ahead um, to what we're going to be doing next week but I'll give you a preview, um, uh, an old, but at the time surprising theorem was that P space and NP space actually are equal. So there this analogy with time breaks down. So polynomial space and non-deterministic polynomial space do turn out to be equal. Um, the, the most obvious way of proving, of trying to simulate an NP, an NP space machine would be give you an exponential deterministic space algorithm. Uh, so we'll go through that. But there is an algorithm which uh, collapses non-deterministic polynomial space down to deterministic polynomial space, which again, at the time was kind of surprising. Uh, and so last question I'll take here, is there some equivalent concept to the idea of a certificate for co-NP? Yes, there is a notion of a certificate, but now it's gonna be a certificate that you're not in the language instead of a certificate that you're in the language. And then again, works for the very same reason that we had certificates for NP languages, where you had certificate for membership. For co-NP, you have certificate for non-membership. I don't know if, there's no other certificate for membership in co-NP. Um, okay, so let's move on. Um, 
Okay, so now we're gonna introduce, we're gonna look at some important examples. These are examples that we're gonna, um, I'm gonna give you two examples. First one called TQBF, and then we're gonna have a second example. Both of those, we're gonna, one of them is gonna be an example of a problem in P space, the other one is gonna be an example of a problem in NP space. Um, and it's, these are gonna be important languages for us. So they're not just gonna serve as examples for today, but you know, um, they're gonna be uh, useful languages for us later on. So just keep that in mind as we're going through, going through it. So to understand TQBF, you have to understand um, what are called quantified Boolean formulas or QBFs. So those are Boolean formulas, just like the ones we've been seeing, we've been talking about with Boolean variables and the ands, ors, and, and negated variables. Um, but now you're gonna add quantifiers. The exist quantifiers and for all quantifiers. If you haven't seen quantifiers, you, you, you need to go back and re, re, you know, review those. Um, you know, I think that we already kind of introduced, talked about them briefly earlier in the, in the term, but um, this is part of the basic math that you need to know. Um, maybe you'll not comfortable with them, you'll pick it up somewhat during uh, the course of the, today's and the next few lectures. But anyway, uh, so if you have a Boolean formula, formula, I'll give you some examples that has exist and for all quantifiers. One of the requirement for it to be a QBF is that all of the variables have to be within the scope of one of the quantifiers. So you, all of the variables of the formula have to be quantified by one of the quantifiers. And the, we're gonna assume the quantifiers are in front, are sort of leading quantifiers in front of the rest of the uh, of the of the rest of the expression. Um, so, because all of the variables have been quantified, then a quantified Boolean formula is going to be either true or false, following the meaning of the quantifiers. Um, and again, some of this may become clear as we do some examples. Uh, uh, Okay, so here are some examples coming. So here is one, here is a QBF. So all of the variables, the, which are just X and Y, they bo both appear in front of, uh, next to some quantifier. So that's gonna be, that's a requirement uh, if we have a um, QBF. And uh, so this says for all X, there exists a Y, this expression uh, holds. So um, we need to kind of unpack that and understand what it means. It says for every X, for, for, for every way of assigning a Boolean value to X, so uh, X is gonna be either true or false, there exists a way of assigning a Boolean value for Y to make this true, to, 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 to make the rest of the expression hold true. Um, and we'll go through that, but let's, let's uh, contrast that with a second example where I invert the order of the quantifiers because that's gonna be important uh, for the meaning of the formula. So if I say for every X, there is a Y, which makes this the rest of it true, that says, well, no matter how I set X, there's gonna be a way to set Y to make this true. So that says, well, if I set X to true, there's gotta be some way to set Y to make, to make the, the, the remaining expression hold. Um, so if I set X to true, what should I set Y to be? Um, well, uh, if I set X to be true, and maybe I set Y to be true. Well, then this, this clause is uh, satisfied, but this clause won't be satisfied. So setting Y to be true is not, it won't work. But for every X, I'm all, all I need to show there exists some Y, so if I pick X to be true, I can set Y to be false. Um, and now this one is this one holds and this one holds and the formula holds. But I have to make sure that that's gonna be the case for both settings of X because I'm saying for all X. So if I set X now to false, because I already showed that it works for X equal to true. If I set X equal to false, if I set now Y to be true, this is gonna hold. So this, expression is true because it is the case that for every way to set X, there is a way to set Y 
So this part holds. Let's look at, let's compare that with this case. Is there some way to set Y such that no matter how I set X, this is gonna hold? And that's not gonna be true. No matter what you pick for Y, um, there is gonna be some way to set X to make this false. So does there exist a Y such that every X makes this true? No. If you try X equal to true, it's not gonna work. If you try X equal to false, it's not gonna work. So this second phi two expression, quantified uh, QBF is false, okay? We're gonna be playing with these a lot. So it's important to understand how this, this quantification works. Um, so TQBF is the problem of testing whether one of these QBFs is true. Or phrase as a language, it's the collection of true, QBF, true QBFs, and that's where we get the, um, uh, the uh, acronym TQBF, not, not an acronym, the, the, the abbreviation TQBF, for the true quantified Boolean formula. Um, so going back to that example, phi one is a true quantified Boolean formula and phi two is not a true quantified Boolean formula. So that's why phi one is in the language, phi two is not in the language. Um, now our computational problem is to test whether quantified Boolean formulas are true or not. And that we can do in polynomial space. Oh, there's a check-in first. I claim that SAT is a special case of TQBF. Why is that? How can we um, think of SAT as a special case? If I give you a SAT formula, how can I see that as also a TQBF problem? If you wanna test if that formula is true. What would you say? Remove all the quantifiers or add some quantifiers and what kind of quantifiers maybe? Um, uh, how is SAT, just testing a formula is satisfiable, a special case of this, what I claim is a more general problem of solving these T -T -Q -B TQBF problems. Okay, closing down, last call. Yes, indeed. You know, satisfiability, so C is correct. When you're talking about a satisfiability problem, you're saying, is there a satisfying assignment? Another way of writing that down is take the Boolean formula, represent, you know, take that Boolean formula and put exists in front of all the variables. Saying, the, is there a, is there exist, does there exist a way to set x1 and x2 and x3 and x4 to make the formula true, make the formula hold? So um, sat is a special case by adding exist quantifiers uh, of a TQBF problem. So C is correct. Um, okay, so why is this problem in p-space as, as I claimed? And for that, we're gonna give a simple recursive algorithm. Um, you know, any uh, quantified Boolean formula, now if you wanna test if it's true or not, you know, we're gonna, basically strip off the leading quantifiers. So if it's an exist quantifier, we'll remove it and plug in true and false associated to its variable and then solve those problems uh, recursively. Okay, so this is just gonna be a recursive procedure for solving um, TQBF problems operating by stripping off the, the quantifiers in front and uh, getting smaller and smaller formulas. But now we're gonna be plugging in uh, values, true and false, um, instead of relying on the quantifier uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, give us the meaning of the formula. Okay. So first of all, if there are no quantifiers, then there are no variables because all variables have to be bound within quantifiers. And in that case, the, uh, that uh, quantified Boolean formula has to simply be the statement true or the statement false. And so you're gonna output accordingly because that's all it can be if you have no variables. Um, if the formula 
starts with an exist quantifier. What you're going to do, so here psi is the remainder of the formula after you strip off that exist quantifier. So you're going to evaluate psi now, but take that variable that was bound by the exist and just plug in true um, or and false respectively. So you're going to get two, two now new problems. Um, and uh, run them uh, and evaluate them using the same procedure recursively, uh, but now with X plugged in for true plugged in for X and also then with false plugged in for X. Um, and uh, get the answers for those two cases. And if either one of them ended up accepting, then you're going to accept because you know there exists a value uh, for X which makes the whole thing true because you, you, you just recursively showed that there was such a value. You know, either true or false, the thing has, has accepted. And if both of them fail, then you're gonna reject. And the very same idea if you have a for all quantifier, you're gonna evaluate the remainder of the formula, uh, again, with X equal to true and false so as two sub problems but now you're gonna require them both to accept because that's the meaning of for all that both assignments to X have to make the formula true. So you're gonna evaluate them recursively and accept if uh, both of them are, are true as determined by your uh, recursive, your, your recursion. Okay, so how much space does this use? Um, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but uh, each recursive level uses just a constant amount of space. So every time you do a recursion, you have to remember that uh, that, that value, uh, uh, that assignment to that to that variable. You, you wanna think of recursion as being implemented on a stack. So you're just gonna pop push on the stack that value of that variable, um, which is that true or false. So basically it's one bit of memory uh, that you're gonna require every time you're going down the, the recursion. You just have to remember what, um, you know, which case you're working on, whether X equal to true or X equal to false. Uh, and um, so each recursive level just involves constant space and the depth of the recursion, you know, how far, how much might you have to remember? Well, it's gonna be at most one for every quantifier um, uh, because that's, you know, you're stripping them off as you're going down the recursion. So that's gonna be at most the length of the formula. That says most of the number of quantifiers you can have. And so uh, the total amount of space used by this is gonna be um, just n, order n. Okay, so this pro problem is solved in, uh, in n space. And so that's why it's in p space. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. Okay, if we regard the tape in a Turing machine as memory uh, in a modern computer, what does the finite control correspond to? The finite control corresponds to just a finite additional memory. Um, the tape is an unlimited amount of memory. Uh, or if we're putting bounds, you know, the amount of tape is gonna be say N squared memory where N is the length of N. N is the length of the input. So um, yeah, they're both memories, but um, the finite control is, it doesn't grow with n, so that's going to be just a, you know, some constant amount of memory. What would be the time complexity of this algorithm? Time complexity would be bad. Um, it's going to be exponential, so you'd have to just double check that. But it's going to be something like two to the uh, number of variables that you have, two to the number of quantifiers, plus some small overhead for evaluating the formula multiple time. But it's going to be exponential. Um, what else can I answer for you? Um, so someone is asking, going back again to Cohen P and how do we know there exists a problem in Cohen P that is Cohen P complete? We didn't define even what that means, but uh, Cohen P complete means, we're gonna start seeing other examples of completeness for different complexity classes, in particular, one of one thing that's going to happen on Tuesdays, we'll see a problem that's complete for p-space, 
in fact, it's going to be TQB, TQBF, um, sort of looking ahead, is going to be a piece-based complete problem. Um, but we even have to have the notion of what we mean by uh, complete for these other classes. And in the case of CoNP, a problem is CoNP complete if it's in, in CoNP and every other CoNP problem is polynomial time reducible to it. So just exactly the same as we had for NP, just plugging in CoNP instead. Um, and uh, you just have to work through the logic, but it's pretty straightforward. The complement of any NP complete problem is gonna be a CoNP complete problem using that definition. Um, uh, so just, I, I don't wanna go through, through that, those simple steps, but you just can go and verify that offline, that, that that's gonna be true. And I think we're gonna probably talk about that later in the semester too. Um, so another question, how does the TQBF algorithm, ah, so this is a good question here. Um, why is the TQBF algorithm that I just described in P space? Doesn't the thing, every time I'm doing the recursion, doesn't things branch out so that I end up using exponential space? Critical thing, which I, don't, I actually don't think I mentioned, which I think is important to observe, is that when you're doing those two recursive calls, when you set X equal to true and you set X equal to false, after you've determined that the, the answer for when you set X equal to true, now you reuse that space, that very same space, to test what happens when you have X equal to false. So that's, that's the power of space, which makes it different from time, is that it can be reused. So after you've got the answer for when you have X equal to true, now you free up that space that's no longer needed anymore. You just remember the answer. And now you see what happens when you have X equal to false using that same space. So there's no exponential blow up. That's, that's an important point. I'm glad you gave me the chance to, to say it. So somebody's asking about defining time of a non-determinist Turing machine to the maximum time of each branch. Well, that's sort of what we have done. Maybe I don't understand your question, but you'll have to ask it after, after um, afterward, because I wanna, I don't wanna be delaying any more than we, than we have. So we're gonna, rest we're gonna go back and um, move on here. Um, okay, second example. Um, and this one is a kind of a fun example, but it's also going to be an important one for us. Um, it's called the ladder problem. Um, so you may have seen something called the word ladder, but to, in general, a ladder is a sequence of strings, which are all of the same length, but where consecutive strings differ in a single symbol. Um, so, uh, so for example, if you have a word ladder for English, it's gonna be a ladder where all the words are English, all of the um, strings are English words. So here's an example. Thought I fixed that. Okay, here is, here is a, um, uh, a word ladder for English. And maybe you've seen these. Suppose I wanna to try to get from work to play, but I, all of the intermediate uh, strings should be English words with four letters that differ from their previous one in only a single letter. And I want to somehow change the word work to the word play. So I don't know if, you know, so for example, I can change work to pork. So here's just one letter difference, um, which looks like it's an improvement because now I have the, I'm agree in agreement on the play. Um, but sometimes, you know, you might change it, you might have a good change and then you have to undo it later, which I think actually happens here. Um, so pork then is port, but then we gave up that progress. We made port to sort, to suit, to slot. You understand, the, you understand what I'm doing here. Each case, I'm just changing a single letter, but all of these words, all of these have to be in legitimate English words of length four. Plot, ploy, and then play. Okay, so that's what a word ladder in English would be. Of course, you can do it in different languages. And I'm gonna talk about it abstractly where 
instead of having a natural human language as being the uh, test for uh, a word be uh, for being a string being legitimate, I'm going to define a um, uh, any old language. Uh, let's say, let's say it's A is going to be some language, some set of strings, and the and the, the those are going to be the legal strings that can be in the ladder. So a ladder in A is a ladder of strings that are all members of A. Um, and now the the ladder DFA problem is A is going to be the language of some DFA. So I'm giving you B. Um, and so I want, and then a start string and an end string. So this is like work and play. U and V are like work and play. So where B is a DFA and its language has a ladder that goes from U to V. So here are the intermediate strings. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, all right. Um, so um, I'm going to show you that this ladder DFA problem is in NP space. Okay, and it's not this is not super hard because basically, uh, well, let, 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 let's just actually look at the slide here. The way it's going to work is it's not deterministically going to guess that sequence from U to V. So if I if I'm trying to get from work to play, imagine those. I'm going to be using this as um, you know, in place of the uh, the of the language of my finite automaton, just because this is easier to talk about. But imagine these are being strings that are that are accepted by that uh, that DFA. Um, so now I'm trying to get from my string U to the string V, and I want to test: Can I get there by some uh, changing one letter at a time, but staying as strings that are accepted by the DFA? Um, I'm just going to guess that sequence non-deterministically. But I have to make sure careful of two things. Um, I, I don't want to guess the sequence all in, in advance because that sequence might be exponentially long. You have to calculate how long it could possibly be, but you might, might, you know, you might change to one symbol, then change it to a different symbol, then change it back to that original symbol. Or so the, the only bound that you can write down is the number of possible strings that you can have of that length. Um, so it might be exponential. Uh, you don't want to write down that whole thing because that's going to be um, exceeding your space bound. But what you don't need to. You're just going to guess them one at a time, forgetting about the previous ones. Just keep guessing the next uh, one in the sequence and only remembering that one and seeing if uh, you ever get to the, the string, your, your target string. But then when you do that, you have to make sure that you don't end up going forever um, because that's not allowed in your, uh, in, your, um, in your NP space algorithm. Uh, so you're gonna have to keep a counter to make sure that if you go beyond that bound, which is gonna be the maximum number of strings you could possibly have, then you're gonna just shut that branch of the non-determinism off. You're gonna just reject on that branch. Okay, so here is, I'm gonna write, the, say this here. Uh, here is my non-deterministic, uh, you know, polynomial space procedure. Um, I'm given my language, my, my DFA B and my start and end strings. I let Y equal the start string, write down the length of my strings that I'm gonna have to keep uh, in mind all the way through. Um, and then I'm going to just repeat the following t times, where t is the maximum length as can be, which is the the size of the alphabet of these of these things to the mth power, where m is the length of those strings. Uh, and I'm just going to non-deterministically change one symbol at a time, making sure that I'm staying in the language. So rejecting immediately if that change introduced a, a string outside the language. And accepting if that string that I get by changing that single symbol um, is now my target. Um, and if I've gone through my bound and I haven't managed to reach uh, that target, then I'm just going to reject. 
Um, and we just have to observe that this algorithm um, doesn't use too much space. So if you imagine what we need, here, here's my input u and v, which is a blank n. And the total amount of space, I just have to remember the current y. Um, and, um, and also my counter t, my counter up to t. So um, each of those can be written down with, it, with uh, essentially n space. So the total amount is going to be order n space. Um, so that shows that uh, this latter DFA problem is actually in non-deterministic space n, non-deterministic linear space. Um, and what we're going to show next um, is that this language is actually solvable in deterministic space. So, and this is kind of perhaps a bit of a surprise. Okay. Um, so what's the size of the input? The size of the input is uh, going to be what it takes to write down the, uh, the DFA and the, uh, the two strings U and V. Um, so uh, um, here, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I should have also included as part of the input, the, the description of B itself. But um, uh, so, but that's gonna be even work in my favor because, um, so this, this is slightly incorrect because B itself has to appear as part of the input. So apologies for that, but still, the amount of uh, space used is going to be order n um, because these are going to be actually less than n. Um, so let me jump so we don't run out of time for the lecture. Uh, we can save uh, additional questions for uh, afterward. I'll stick around for a few minutes. I just really have one more slide here. Um, and that is proving this theorem that ladder can be done in deterministically in polynomial space. And that's going to be important as a kind of a um, preview of what we're going to be doing on Tuesday. Um, and, you know, um, if this goes a little fast, I'll go over it again on Tuesday. So let's just see how it goes. So I'm going to show the same ladder DFA problem um, is solvable deterministically in polynomial space. And, but this time it's going to be in squared space instead of non-deterministically in n space. So there's going to be some cost but it's only going to be a squaring. So remember what the problem is. You know, I'm giving you that DFA and I'm giving you two strings in the language of that DFA. And I want to know, can I get from one, the first string to the second string by changing one symbol at a time, but always making sure that the strings are along the way are accepted by that DFA. Okay. So I'm going to introduce notation saying, can I get from string u to v by a ladder? But now I'm limiting how many steps I can take. So I'm sort of writing u to v, but doing it only within b, b intermediate strings, b steps. So is there a ladder from u to v of length at most b? That's what it means to write this notation down. So I'm going to uh, give you a recursive procedure to solve the bounded ladder problem where it's just like the pre before, but now I'm going to say, not only does there a ladder from u to v, but there's a ladder of length at most b. Okay, so, and that's going to allow me to solve the ladder problem recursively by shrinking the size of b. Um, uh, okay. So um, let's, how is this going to work? Uh, um, well, here's going to be the idea. So here is my u and my v. Um, and the procedure is going to work by, instead of non-deterministically guessing the steps that take me from work to play, because I don't have non-determinism anymore. I have to operate deterministically. What I'm going to do is work instead of um, I'm going to instead of going from looking at the very first uh, thing that follows from from you, I'm going to jump right to the middle, 
and try every possible middle string. All of, I have no clue even what that middle string should look like. So I'm going to try all possibilities in the sequence. But then I'm going to use, once I have one of those possibilities, I'm going to recursively try to solve the problem by splitting that now, uh, but I'm now going to divide uh, that B value in half. Okay, so here is the maximum value we can have. This is the T from the previous slide, which is the maximum length. Um, and I, uh, here I'm going to try every possible intermediate. Let's start off with A, all A's. Um, and now I, I cut the problem in half. Can I get from work to all A's and all A's to play? Well, very first thing I should check is make sure that all A's, in fact, is a string uh, in the language. And if we're thinking of the language as sort of, you know, matching it, it's like English, all A's is not a legitimate word. So you try the next one, A, 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 B. And this is how it's going to work. But now you're going to be, instead of using English, you're going to feed it into the finite automaton. Just one after the next, trying every possibility until, you know, like a clock, like, a, like an odometer, trying them all until eventually you find a string that's in the language. Sort of, I'm representing that by an English word, able. Maybe that's the first word that you would have found. And then once you find that, you're gonna now, can I get from work to able and able to play recursively reusing the space again, but now where the bound is cut in half. Okay, so that's, that's the whole algorithm. So, um, just going through it quickly, and I will do this again. Um, uh, here is my DFA going from U to V within B steps. First of all, oh, this is bad. Uh, T should not be one, B, this should be B. If B is one, um, can I quickly fix that? Uh, so these T's should be B's, my apologies. Um, so if T is one, if B is one, then they have to, then I'm only allowed a, a, a ladder of length one. Now I just check it directly. Do U and V differ in just in, in one place? Um, if yes, then I accept, else I reject. Uh, if it's greater than one, now I'm gonna do this procedure that I described. I'm gonna try for each possible W uh, in the middle, um, I'm going to uh, uh, try that W, test whether I can get from U to W in half the number of steps and from W to V in half the number of steps, and accept if they both accept. Um, and if trying all possible Ws, none of them work, then I know that there's no way to get from U to V in B steps, and so then I reject. OK? And then to do the original problem, which was not the bounded ladder problem. I just do the bounded I, I do the bounded ladder problem, where I put in t, which is the maximum possible length that it could be to get from work to play, or to get from u to v. Okay, so the space analysis. Um, well, I'm kind of out of time here, so we're, we're going to go through this again next time. Um, like we have a very quick. So let me skip that uh, analysis. I'll review this next time. I have a very quick check-in. I just want to get to you, get get here. Um, find an English word ladder that connects the word must to the word vote. You can think about that. I mean, I, it's not that hard to come up with a, such a word ladder. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to think about that also to think about voting, which is also important. Um, that's coming up. Um, Okay, another five seconds here. Um, okay, I'm gonna end this. So make sure you get your credit for the uh, check-in. Okay, so uh, we're at the end of the hour, um, end, of the, uh, end, of the 90, end, end of the 80 minutes anyway. Uh, so this is what we did today um, and Looks like I ran over by a minute, so uh, my apologies. And but I'll stick around here um, if any of you have any further questions. So, but otherwise, uh, lecture is over. Uh, see you guys. Do we know anything about ladder for other kinds of languages? I I, I don't know.
um, uh, interesting question whether you can say uh, some nice things about the latter, um, the latter um, problem in other in other cases. I, I don't know. Okay, why is t here? This value of t, sigma to the m, the maximum length of a um, of a word ladder. So what, do, what, what? First of all, we have to m. Maybe I should have written this down. M is the 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 length of the words. Uh, sigma is the alphabet of the words. Um, so the number of possible different words is sigma to the m. These are all possible words that there could possibly be. So uh, there's no reason in a word ladder ever to repeat a word, because you can just find a shorter word ladder that still does the job of connecting to uh, connecting um, a start and the end. So you can just cut out that middle part, um, the repeated part. Uh, so in that case, um, the longest possible word ladder is going to be the, the total number of possible words that you can have, which is going to be sigma, the size of sigma to the m. Explain again why cohen p is a subset of p space. Um, well, maybe I'll say it this way: take the why is a, why is every cohen p language also in p space? Well, take the complement of your cohen p language. That's an np language. An NP language is in P space because we proved that that's what we proved. Um, uh, but if a, if a language is in P space, its complement is also in P space because for a deterministic procedure, you can just flip the answer of the machine. Um, so now you get, you know, if so, if B language B is in Cohen P, its complement B, B complement is in NP, which is in P space, but now. So B complement is in P space. So now P space, you can invert the answer and now you, B is also in P space. I hope that helps. Um, somebody's giving me the answer to get from uh, uh, must to vote. But you know, I, I, I've seen that answer and that's, you know, there are online tools that will answer word ladders. Um, so you just pl plug in the two, you know, way, the start and the finish, and it'll give you the word ladder. <laughs> and then the one that this person has sent me is the one you get from that that tool. So I suspect <laughs> didn't find it himself. I, I actually, uh, before lecture, I actually saw it on my own. Besides the one that I know, the one that the one that the tool will give you. So I, that tool gives one and uh, I think five steps. And I, and I found one on my own of six steps. It's not that hard. But yeah, must, most, lost lose, rose, wrote, and vote. I think maybe that's seven steps. Um, anyway, it's, it's, you can solve the, the, For short words, you can solve these generally pretty quickly on your own. Um, what, else, what else can I do for you? Um, do we need to worry about coming back to a previously visited word, visited word on the construction on this page? No, we don't have to worry about coming back to a previously visited word. All you need to worry about is making sure that you bound how long you're gonna go for. And that's where the previously visited uh, issue comes in. You know, if, if the, um, if the uh, word letter that you found repeats some word, well, then there would, would have been a shorter word letter that would have also worked, but, uh, you know, it still shows that it's possible to get from the uh, the start word to the finish word um, if you if you if you have a repeated one in between. So that that doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about that. If you did, then it would be a problem. So I think I will. It's four or five. I think I'm going to head out. Uh, uh, see you all, guys, and uh, I'm going to join my TAs in a meeting shortly. So bye bye. Thank you for being here. <laughs>